only the USSR exploited the genius of the American tank designer Walter Christie, whose inventions underwrote World War II's best tank, the Soviet T-34. US Intelligence and Soviet Armor Hi everyone, as you probably figured out by now, uh, today we're going to be talking about the Christie tanks, specifically the development and their purchase by the Soviet Union. Christie didn't start working on tanks, far from it. He started his engineering career working on ships. He was quite successful at that and only migrated from sea to land in 1901. That's when he started working on cars. He built racing cars and he was quite successful at it. His front wheel drive scheme was quite revolutionary for the time, but didn't really reach commercial success. What did reach commercial success was his fire engine business. He would make an attachment for horse-drawn fire engines that would allow fire departments to very easily convert their old horse-drawn uh, cars into more modern ones without, uh, exp without costing too much. Christie's involvement with military vehicles came soon after. Using his front-wheel drive technology, he developed an all-terrain tractor to be used by the U.S. Army during General Pershing's raid into Mexico. Now, it's often said that uh, this was an all-wheel drive tractor. This wasn't the case. It was a front-wheel drive tractor. Uh, and even though the Army didn't really like it, it was quite revolutionary at the time, and so Christie was on the military's radar. He worked for the U.S. military throughout World War I. Uh, he developed first a, a self-propelled uh, anti-aircraft gun mount, then a self-propelled 8-inch howitzer mount, and finally a convertible drive 155 millimeter cannon mount. Now these vehicles were produced and they were tested. Uh, none of them really quite reached success. He, Christie got close. His 8 inch cannon mount would have been mass produced had World War I not ended. As many tanks and various other vehicle designs, the, this was the end of the development since there was no more money to build tanks. Christie continued working on land vehicles after the war. Namely, he built several medium tanks for the U.S. Army. However, he was quite a difficult character to deal with, and instead of building what he was told to do, he built what he thought the Army needed, which did not compress the military at all. Now, in, by 1924, the Army had spent $800,000 in building his designs, none of which quite proved satisfactory. This was the end, and Christie was kicked out of the Ordnance Department, or he quit himself. Christie got quite a nice severance package, $100,000, a lot of money at the time. He used this money to develop new vehicles, and in 1928, the Christie M1928 tank, or as Christie called it, the M1940 tank, implying that it was 12 years ahead of its time, uh, this tank was put through trials. It was quite an impressive machine. It could drive much faster and much longer than comparable American tanks, and it had a very interesting suspension system. Now, why was the suspension so revolutionary? Well, most tanks at the time, like this T26 here, had a bogey suspension. So you can see that this bogey here, consisting of four to four wheels, they can't really move that much in relation to each other. Therefore, it makes for a very stable drive as long as you are on terrain that isn't very bumpy while the suspension can still move to hug it. But as soon as you hit a large bump, the entire tank starts shaking very violently because the suspension bottoms out and the springs no longer actually absorb anything. Now, here's an unfinished model kit. And as you can see here, in a Christie suspension, the cutouts for the wheel... Uh, the suspension arms go quite high up. Now on a finished tank here, we can actually see that the cutout for the suspension arm uh, in the back here is almost as tall as the wheel itself. So there is quite a lot of vertical travel which can absorb impact from, uh, from very large bumps. Another interesting aspect of this running gear was the convertible drive. Now, you might hear some very interesting theories that were made popular by the book Icebreaker that this tank was, the BT-7 tank was made as a unique offensive tank and its uh, convertible drive was designed to drive down the Autobahns into Germany. Uh, that is quite a ridiculous theory. The actual reason why this was done was very practical. It was because the lifespan of track lengths at the time was very, very poor. And this was, uh, for example, why Renault, uh, Renault FT tanks and various other small tanks, even the American light tank T1, were delivered to the battlefield on trucks. It was because the lifespan of the suspension and especially the tracks was so low 
that they uh, they couldn't drive even a single kilometer more than necessary, or they would simply break before they would be used in battle. So Christie was quite the patriot, uh, and he promised that everything he did, he did for the good of his country. Now this, of course, interested the U.S. military, who was once again looking into buying Christie tanks after all these years. However, after promising to order 250 of these light tanks, the Great Depression started. The army no longer had any money, and Christie was laid out to dry. Now, uh, Christie did find some foreign buyers. In 1930, he signed a contract with Poland for one tank, and a contract with the Soviet Union for two tanks. Technical blueprints, uh, technical assistance, where Christie himself even offered to travel to the USSR to help set up production. And the USSR even got a license for all of Christie's improvements for the next 10 years that would be made to this tank. Now, there is another myth that is connected with these tanks. It says that these tanks were sent to the USSR disguised as tractors so that the US government wouldn't stop Christie from exporting them. The truth is the Soviet representative company in the US, uh, it's called Amtorg, they explicitly asked for permission from Washington, and this permission was granted. So the tanks were exported quite legally. Uh, that, isn't, that isn't to say that the transaction went off without a hitch. The, uh, the USSR's assessment of Christie's financial situation was very dire. Uh, according to them, Christie was on the verge of bankruptcy, and he might not have had the resources to develop his tanks at all. Christie himself didn't help the situation any. He constantly threatened the USSR, uh, saying that if they didn't, uh, they didn't give him more money or pay sooner, that he would work on the Polish tank instead of their tank, or he would work on American tanks instead of their tank, etc., uh, etc., et which wasn't very impressive for the USSR side, uh, especially since they talked to his employees and really found out that the order from the Ordnance Department is quite low. In fact, only seven tanks uh, were sold to the US Army at all. And uh, Christie himself was in a very, very difficult situation. He ended up shipping these tanks to the USSR, but the documentation that came with them was incomplete. And most importantly, these tanks are shipped without a turret. Uh, Steven Zaloga tells me that the reason this was was because that Christie did not have a turret design at all. The turret that was used on the Christie M1931 tank was actually an Ordnance Department design. Now the contract that was signed between Christie and the USSR does stipulate that a turret with a commander's cupola that would fit a single person must be designed, but it appears that such a turret was never made. The two tanks that were sent to the USSR were put through trials. Now it is often said that all the Soviets did was put a turret on top of the chassis that arrived and called the PT-2 tank, that is far from the truth. In reality, uh, the tank that arrived was very picky, uh, the transmission was very unreliable, the engine was very unreliable, uh, the running gear actually broke several times after running a very short distance, it was very difficult to drive, and so the verdict was that it makes absolutely no sense to copy this tank. The BT tank, or the BT-2 tank as it was called in 1933, uh, it was a quite a significant redevelopment of the tank. Uh, it kept the general layout in hull shape, but if you look at photographs, they are quite noticeably different. 396 tanks were built in the USSR in 1932, and 224 more in 1933. However, production of the BT-2 tank ended after that. It was replaced by the BT-5 tank, which had a much better M17 engine uh, compared to the M5 engine on the BT-2. It was much more reliable and uh, much more suited for service in the USSR. Uh, and the turret with a 37mm gun or a machine gun was replaced by the large turret with a 45mm gun that I've shown before. Now, even though one of the complaints about the tank was that the Soviet M5 uh, and the imported Liberty engines, which were used to build the first BT-2 tanks, were quite unreliable, these tanks remained in service until the Great Patriotic War. In fact, uh, on the Leningrad front in the north, where older vehicles were much more common, you could see these tanks fight until 1942, which again was quite impressive for such an old tank. Now the BT-2 might not have been the most powerful tank, it didn't have the thickest armor, it didn't have the biggest gun, uh, it was quite quickly replaced by a much faster, much reliable tank, but it did give what the USSR needed most in the 1930s, experience. Soviet industry learned to build a fast tank armed with a powerful engine, 
and the Red Army learned how to use it and how to service it, and even though it was replaced quite quickly, it was an important stepping stone on the way to the best Soviet tank of World War II, the T-34.